All right, explorers, welcome to another read around the world, and it all starts right now. Let's do it. All right, welcome back, everyone, live from the Dawnland. We have another Read Around the World program. So the Dawnland is the northeastern part of the United States. We're coming to you live today from our studio in Portland, Maine. And we are located on ancestral lands of the Wabanaki Confederacy. So if you don't know whose native land you live on, we highly recommend this tool. It's called native-land.ca. You can come find out whose native land you live on in the United States of America or Canada or wherever you're watching from today. Fun fact, the reason this whole area of the United States is called the Dawnland is because look how far east it is. So the sun rises every morning and the light hits this part of Turtle Island first every single day. So that's where we're located. Welcome everyone. My name's Brandon. I'm going to be your host on today's program, but it's not about me today. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce our guest today. Our guest today is Miss uh, Gloria Amesqua, and she is uh, coming to us live from, there we go, let's start back a little further out, from Austin, Texas today, and she's going to be reading part of one of her books for us today and talking all about that writing process and uh, maybe some challenges and uh, successes she had in the writing of her book as well. So welcome to the show, uh, Gloria, and how are you today in Austin? Oh, we're fine. It's uh, cloudy and a little, it's nice and cool. And we're hoping for rain this afternoon. We've really kind of been in a drought. So let the rains come. There you go. So hopefully those rains will come and give all of your vegetable gardens and those flowers out in your yards some <laughs> much needed water today. <laughs> so uh, welcome to the program, uh, Gloria. And in a minute, but not yet, I'm going to let Gloria take over the program, if you're new to uh, learn around the world, read around the world, uh, the process today is going to be pretty simple. Uh, she's going to read a selection of her book. She's going to introduce herself and uh, tell us lots of other cool information around the story and the process of writing this book. And then we're just going to open up for some Q&A. So let us know where you're watching from today in your chats or if you're watching from anywhere, uh, any of the streams out there in the stream of verse, you can use hashtag read around the world over on Twitter. If you would prefer to send in your questions there, we would love to know where you're watching from here today as well. So without further ado, I'm going to throw it over to uh, you, Gloria. Gloria, before we get started, do you want to tell us uh, anything uh, about yourself uh, and, uh, and possibly maybe let's go, what's your favorite kind of candy? Do you have a favorite kind of candy? Or when you were little, possibly? Of course, chocolate. Any kind of, <laughs> any kind of chocolate. <laughs> there Although you go. I'm trying to stay away. It's very hard. Awesome. All right. So I know you're going to introduce your book and yourself through some of your uh, pictures that you shared with us. So I'll bring that up for you. And uh, you can go ahead and run away with it. Well, I am the author of my first book uh, called Child of the Flower Song People. Lucy Menes, Daughter of the Nawa. And that's a long title, I know. It just grew. But um, I'm very excited about the story. It's about an indigenous girl in Mexico in the early 1900s who had a lot of struggles and hardships. But despite that, she uh, wanted to be a teacher. And the Mexican Revolution kind of... Uh, destroyed that dream, but she was, uh, became a model for famous artists and also helped scholars record uh, Nahuatl, the language of the Nahua, and uh, really contributed uh, a legacy to the world by helping save the, the language of the, of the Nahua. Uh, so she's an important person that most of us have never heard about, and I was very excited to write her story. So that's just kind of an overview. Uh, this is a, me when I was about fourth grade. And uh, I just wanted you to see that I was just a kid like any other kid and uh, had dreams. And uh, I became a teacher and, the, and then an author. 
So um, I'm very excited to be here with you and with Read Around the World. This is a poem I wrote when I was about that age. I'm brown, not from the sun, but from my birth. I'm like a sunflower growing through a crack in the earth. So I wrote poetry most of my life, as well as teaching. But then I started writing children's books uh, when I had my granddaughters. So um, I want to tell you a little bit more about kind of as an introduction. So next. Uh, because this is a biography about a real person, Luce, also known as Luciana, um, here she is in a photograph, an early photograph, and some of the artists who are painting her. And uh, I want to show you some other uh, photos of her. Next. This is a, a photo by a famous photographer of Lucy Menes and her daughter. Uh, young, she only had one child, um, Concha, and um, uh, there are other photos of her and her daughter, but she also was, uh, sculptors sculpted her, art, different artists that became famous, uh, painted her on murals and artwork, so we really, uh, she was kind of the image of the Native woman in the artist's uh, artwork. Here's another one uh, where she's kind of in the background here by Fernando Leal. And um, that was in 1921, which is a hundred years ago. But her work and her influence still comes today. Matter of fact, there is an art exhibit that was recently put on in Washington, D.C. by an artist who did weavings and uh, they were to capture uh, loose in her spirit and her legacy. Next. Here is La Tortillera, the tortilla maker uh, by Diego Rivera. And another. Next. This one I wanted to show. Uh, this is a really famous one of her. And by standing by it is her grandson, Jesus Villanueva Hernandez. And Jesus, um, I got to uh, interact with him, email him, and he uh, gave me resources and encouraged me. And he stayed with me on the long road to publication. So I really am happy to have been able to communicate with him. And um, uh, he's a wonderful person and he is trying to keep his mother's legacy alive and to let people know about it. And I'm happy to be able to help do that with this book. Thank you. Um, here, I wanted to talk to you about the Aztecs and the Nahua. Uh, you may have heard of Aztecs before. Uh, you may not have heard of Nahua, but the Aztecs are what people call the uh, ancient people, the ones that lived several hundred years before, even though that's not what they call themselves, but they call themselves Nawa. And I use both words uh, in the book because uh, people are more familiar with Aztecs and I use Aztecs for the historical people and Nawa for the people uh, nowadays. But you may have seen those, uh, those images and thought of Aztecs. So I have another word that I use that is a Nahuatl word. It's flower song, Xochiquicatl. And I wanted uh, to use that because it is a metaphor for the beauty of the people. And um, I, I, it's an important word that I kind of got the idea to use the flowers as a metaphor uh, throughout the book. Next. Okay, so now I'm going to read some of the book, and uh, I will not be reading all the pages, and I won't be reading all of some pages. I'll just read a little bit, and some I'll just talk about, and some I'll skip because we have only a limited time, but this is the beginning of Lucy Minnis, a story. A girl stared at the stars sprinkling the hammock of sky. Like many other nights, she listened to the whisperings of the ancient Aztecs in the wind. 
She heard their sochiquicado, their flower song. She listened as the elders repeated tales their grandfathers had told. Tales their grandfathers' grandfathers had told. How sacred streams and mountains protect them. How the Nahua lost their land to Cortez, the conqueror, and to the Spaniards who followed him. She was Luz Jimenez, child of the flower song people, the powerful Aztecs who call themselves Nahua, who lost their land, but who did not disappear. In Milpa Alta, a village slung between two mountains, Luz's father harvested maguey and corn. She watched closely as her mother taught her how to grind corn in a metate, how to twist yarn with her toes, how to weave on a loom. She hummed as she worked, words glowing and swirling in her head in the Aztec language, Nahuatl. This was life for the Nawa, and Luz soaked it all in. Evenings by the fire, Luz listened eagerly to stories about how might it seem the trail of the Aztecs was swept to the top of a mountain where she cries in the wind at night, pulling her long black hair. Mornings on the way to market, Luz and her mother passed a teacher's house. Students bent over reading. Luz carried an empty place inside. She yearned to know what was written on the papers, a secret longing began to bud in her heart. The secret fluttered lightly like wings in her chest. She would study hard. She would learn what the squiggles meant. She would learn to read. But Luce, like the other native people, was a forgotten shadow to those who govern. There was no public school for them. Then suddenly, the government offered free schooling. No, required it to turn the native children into modern ones, like the descendants of the Spanish who ruled the country, who thought only their ways were right and proper. If the students spoke Nahuatl instead of Spanish, the teachers punished them. They had to give up their Nahuatl clothes, wear modern ones like in the cities. The budding flower in Lucy's heart might have withered, but it did not. Her body tingling, Luz spilled her secret to very few. I want to be a teacher when I grow up. Her secret yearning was beginning to bloom, imagining teaching future generations. But at 13, her dreams whirled away in a storm. The Mexican Revolution came to Milpa Alta. Soldiers stole their food. They burned her precious home and school to rubble. Her father, like nearly all the men, was shot and killed. Luz and her mother and sisters fled to Mexico City at night, stars lighting the way. Others followed. Luz said, not a soul was left. And on this next page, I show... Um, Talk about the city, and let me just interrupt here and say that this wonderful artwork is by Duncan Thonatillo, uh, artist who's written many of his own books and illustrated them, and I'm really honored that he illustrated this one. So here she is in the city, and it's very strange, and they're struggling to uh, find a way to live, and Luz found a way by becoming a model. She found a job posing for artists drawn to her strong features, her sturdy body, her large, dark eyes. Next. As she posed, she taught them the gifts she had learned from her beginnings, grinding corn in a metate, twisting yarn with her toes, weaving on a loom. Luz was a natural model and teacher. She understood what the artists needed without being told. But those artists um, formerly had been uh, just basically uh, painting the European, the Spanish, and um, the Native people weren't really uh, uh, 
noticed, but then they began to be noticed by the artists and by Luce and other models who they uh, learned from. Uh, the next one shows that she, uh, she not only took artists to religious uh, uh, celebrations and uh, she also took anthropologists or linguist scholars who were writing about the Mawa. Next. She told her stories to a professor and he wrote down what she patiently told him in Nahuatl, word by word, phrase by phrase, week by week. So the next page, is, you see that Luce became a teacher to scholars in colleges. So she became a teacher even though she thought she, her, her chances of doing that had disappeared. And the next page, at long last, Lucy's heart bloomed fully. Her dream of being a teacher had come true, true in more ways than the young girl gazing at the sprinkled stars could have ever imagined. Just by being Nala, just by being herself, Luce breathed life into such a quick idol the flower song of Anawa, and carried their fading voice into the future. So let's see if we can go quickly through some of these. This is a picture of Duncan Donatillo. I wanted to show you that. And next. Here are some of the processes I went through in writing this story. Because it's a picture book, you want to know that you have some image of the words that you're writing to go with each one. But this is a very early one, and most of this, except for a few facts, did not make it into the final book. Next. This is an early draft, and I revised a lot, so many times, you can't believe it. And um, a lot of this, again, did not make it. And it's in paragraphs, so that change became more lyrical, more poetic as I revised. Next. I also wrote a poem because I'm a poet and that helped me get the images that I wanted to include. Uh, some of these made it into that, particularly the flower song and um, the image of the being shadows, but a lot of it didn't make it at all. Okay, the next. I wanted to leave you with some tips. Um, first of all, write what you care about and that no one else can write what you, uh, the stories you have or the poems you have because you're unique, you're special and no one has your stories but you. So I hope that you write them and write what you care about. Uh, then revision is really for me the joy of writing. That's it's hard for me to first put down a story and then definitely it can get better and that others can help you make your stories better. There are a lot of people who helped me make a Lucy story much better. They suggested things, they, they, they uh, told me things to cut out or things that maybe needed to be uh, changed. And so I listened to those. Writers were once kids just like you. So, um, you know, that's why I showed you that picture of me because I was just a kid, just like you. And also, if you write, you're a writer. Uh, and so think of yourself as a writer. So that I think that's the last one, right? There we go. It All right. Sure so, is. Uh, do we have questions? Yep, we're going to get into some questions here, um, some that are coming in, some that I have and as well. And I know that uh, a couple things before we moved away that you were just talking about that I think are really great reminders out there for everyone. One of the big themes that's come up over and over again after each and every author we've had on here is the process of editing and revising. So for those younger students out there, this is if you ever feel like the first time you write something, like that very first time you put pen to paper and you don't, you're really not that happy with it, that's okay. So many of us, and, and my, myself, I had to get over this as a student. And one of my best advices I ever got from a teacher was 
no one is a good writer on the first draft. It always takes multiple drafts. So I'm so glad you shared that with everyone today. Uh, also, it, w and the other thing that really jumped out, you know, I work with a lot with video, and I've never heard this before, but essentially with the, with the picture book writing, your visualization is essentially a storyboard uh, that you're working with. Yes. And uh, it's yeah. almost the exact same process. I, that's fascinating. Yeah. All right. And so we do have some questions coming in. Uh, shout out to our classrooms in South Carolina uh, joining us today and everywhere else as well. So please let us know where you're watching from. And uh, this is a question we get almost every time we have one of these programs. What is your favorite book? Oh, I cannot name one favorite book. I have so many favorite books. Uh, just impossible. Uh, I, if I just go to my childhood, it was The Wizard of Oz. Uh, it was the first big book that I remember uh, reading, and I was really proud of myself for reading. It was a thick book, but that's one that, that stayed with me. I really loved that one. Um, I, I have too many to name, so I'm sorry. I can't <laughs> narrow it down. No problem. In a very similar question, uh, you talked a lot today about poetry. Uh, do you have, maybe not a favorite, but do you have a poet that really maybe inspires or has influenced your work and your poetry? Uh, it, actually, it's Carmen Thyphoria, and uh, she's written poetry, and she's also written children's books. Uh, and the reason she influenced me, she's not real, real famous, but uh, she lives uh, in San Antonio, which is not too far from Austin. But she wrote about her experiences as a Mexican-American and uh, as a Latina and used some Spanish in her work. And that um, was a big influence to me because... I realized that I could do that as well. And I, I really did uh, start writing my poetry uh, using Spanish in some cases where it was uh, imp important to do that. And as, as well to, to write more about my experience as a Latina in the United States as a Mexican American. Great, and I think that's a, a fantastic reminder. If, if you don't see uh, people that are doing what you want to do when you grow up uh, that look like you, they're there. They're out there. So uh, even if you may not see it at first in your library, uh, or maybe you do, and no matter if you do or you don't, it's really important that you go find those people that inspire you to create all the great things that you're going to create. Because as Gloria reminded us earlier, no one can tell your story like you can. Exactly. It was a great exactly. reminder. And uh, so do you have a, do you have a, so this is your first and only children's book, is that correct? My first and only. Hopefully there'll be more. Uh, there are some that, one that's uh, going to be under contract, another that's going out uh, to a publisher to, um, to see if they'll take it. Yeah, it, it's a long process. It took me uh, about seven and a half years for this book from start to finish. And that's because I was totally new to it and had to go through the process of getting an agent and all of that. But it, it, it's a long process. But I wanted the story to be told. I thought it was important. So I kept at it. Can't give up. Exactly. Oh, that, that's a great advice. And so what the one of the other themes that we've, I've noticed with each and every artist, everyone has different inspirations and, and we all can find it in our lives from different places. Some authors have come on and they've gotten inspiration from their kids or even their pets. Or uh, in your case with this book, you know, uh, with historical figures that you wanted to share their story with the world and, and bring it to light. So with your upcoming books, you don't have to tell us uh, what they are, uh, but uh, what are some types of um, inspiration in your upcoming books that you've gotten, maybe from your grandchildren, maybe from other places. Where do you get inspiration from? 
a lot of it has been from my grandchildren and uh, the uh, things that they've done or they've talked about uh, just have given me ideas. Uh, and then uh, some of it is from something I've read and, I, and it's historical and I want to uh, tell those stories that we haven't heard. I know when I was growing up, uh, we really did not have any stories at all about uh, people who were like me and we needed those. It would have been so important to me uh, to have read stories by and about Latinos. Um, so uh, not only that, but it would have been important for me to read about other cultures too. And this story is about culture and I and keeping the culture and being able to be proud of who you are. And I would have loved to have had a book like that. Um, and the, as I said, others are from just things that um, are ideas about things that my grandchildren have inspired me or my own son too when he was young so awesome and a lot this of is this, a... hopefully some of them will come out <laughs> there you go uh here's a great question um uh, what so you showed us earlier here i'll bring up the the picture again but uh, earlier you were talking about the, the Aztec, and for those that don't know, so we're talking about the, the central region of Mexico around modern-day Mexico City, if you've heard of Mexico City. Uh, and let's see, where was that picture? <laughs> I'll bring it up. And so um, you showed us uh, the pyramid from this. Oh, here we go. Um, so did you, have you visited uh, this location? Yeah. Yes, I took both of these pictures. Uh, I'm on the Pyramid of the Sun, and the, the one that you see is the Pyramid of the Moon. And it was a while back. I don't think I could climb that uh, pyramid at this time of my life. But I did climb to the top, and it was a beautiful scene. And what I found out in my research, and I did a lot of research, um, is that actually this is older than the tribes of the Aztecs, but people think of these when you think of the Aztecs. Um, but, um, and this is right outside of Mexico City. And uh, here are some of the glyphs. They, this was part of telling their stories uh, in a visual way. And that's why their language is very mer metaphorical because they are visual, using a visual way of of speaking and instead of a written alphabet they use these drawings uh, now they have developed a written phonetic uh, alphabet and uh, agreed upon it and they did that in Milpa Alta in the 1940s but uh, still not that long ago that they actually settled on a written way of keeping the language so that's I learned a lot doing research <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, and I, we, we run programs here at Learn Around the World uh, about this region, and, and glyphs are really neat to look into. So for those that haven't heard, if maybe you've seen pictures of how the Egyptians wrote, right? Those were hieroglyphs, so glyphs are, right? And these were full languages, by the way, not just a, not an emoji, not I heart New York City, which is a <laughs> symbol. These were actual languages, or are actual languages, a full script. And so it's a really sophisticated uh, writing system. And, um, and so I, I think uh, it's a lot easier to write with pictures today. We don't have to be artists when we can push a button and uh, <laughs> get those pictures for us, which are really neat. Uh, so yeah, so that's a, a, a great area. I think of the, the pyramid, I'll bring it back again. Um, I was just actually looking at the other day, you can, um, so if you're nervous or don't feel like you could climb up the pyramid in the, in the hot weather down there, don't worry. There's other ways you could see up there. They, they're, uh, you can take hot air balloon rides right over these um, pyramids as well for any brave souls that aren't afraid of heights out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're going to uh, start kind of winding some things down here. So if you have any questions in your classrooms that you would uh, like to ask uh, our author today, before we have to let her go, feel free to make sure you get those in and uh, because we want to make sure that you get to ask those live. If not, uh, feel free to follow up with us uh, via email and I'm sure 
um, we could get those questions answered for you as well um, if that's at a later time. Uh, if anyone is interested to follow you along with you about any of your upcoming stories and books or possibly even uh, going out there and getting their own copy and don't go anywhere if you're watching because you may have a chance to get your own copy here in just a few minutes but um, where can they go do you have a website or I do and it's just Gloria com. so um, yeah that that's it's simple and uh, it has additional information has teachers guides as well links to teachers guides uh, 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 more than one and hopefully there will be one uh, by the end of June that Abrams the publisher is doing by the end of June in Spanish so uh, oh there it is there's my website and you can find out more uh, things about uh, the book and reviews and there are photos additional photos of Luce and more information about her um, in the artwork and some there's just a ton of information on the website so it'd be great if you visited I would love for you to and that's great and I have and upcoming events and everything listed as well there you go so everyone make sure you go uh, check out that website and speaking of her publisher so we want to go ahead and uh, throw this out there for everyone as well but uh, but Abrams um, uh, books have been very uh, generous and they are actually going to donate some copies of uh, the child of the flower song people so if you're here with us live today uh, and I have enough books for all of our classrooms that I can see in our webinar today so each of you are going to get a copy of your very own generously donated by Abrams Brook so I want to give a big old thank you to them out there and a big old thank you to our guest author today, Gloria, thank you so much for sharing your story, your book, and this wonderful story on Cinco de Mayo today. So everyone go out there and look more uh, into uh, this book, uh, uh, the character, and the history here. I think it's a wonderful story. Feliz Cinco de Mayo. There we go. And I'm and so glad to have been invited to be part of this uh, Read Around the World. I'm, I'm really uh, glad I was able to do this and to have you know something about uh, this book and uh, the story behind it. And hopefully a little bit more about the writing process. Thank you so much for sharing. And a reminder for everyone watching this now or in the future, connect this to your own home. We always remind our uh virtual field trip attendees and our guest speaking attendees here at the program as we go learning around the world always make those connections back to your home in this story you may think to yourself well this happened in Mexico so what all throughout the United States of America where I live in Maine today native and indigenous peoples were not allowed to speak their languages uh, had to go to school and speak other languages cut their hair a lot of really nice things were done to people in the United States of America as well very similar to this story here so go out there learn your history where you live and as I open the show up today if you don't know whose native land you live on this is one of our favorite resources here at learn around the world it's a website called native-land.ca if you go here you can just type in where you live on that left box over here on Turtle Island and it will tell you all the different native lands throughout North America, AKA Turtle Island. So we highly encourage you to go out there, uh, connect and learn from the indigenous peoples and land that you live on. And, uh, and that will be our uh, reminder we always uh, give to everyone out there. So we wanna give a big old, once again, a big old thank you to Gloria. Thank you so much for your time today. And, uh, and I'll definitely be following up with you. Do you have any uh, closing or last minute um, uh, Anything you would like to share with us? <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I, I just want everyone to be, to, first of all, to know that everyone has a culture. It's not just certain uh, people. Everyone uh, has a culture and should be proud of that culture. And what is culture? It's everything that you take in when you're growing up, your your language, your, your history, your friends, your parents, uh, 
it, it, it's the music, food, it's all of that, but it's so much more than that. And we all develop our own culture and be proud of who you are. That's the main thing. Be proud of who you are. That's what I want everyone to do. All right. Well, from all of us here live at the Dawnland in Portland, Maine, thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Abram Brooks. Uh, sorry, Abrams Brooks. And thank you, all of you explorers, for coming and learning around the world with us today. Until next time, keep reading. Oh.